hit record. All right, today, yeah, today, um, welcome to today's uh, uh, kind of Texas uh, Coach to Coaches. Uh, today's is our first Tuesday at 12.30 p.m. session. And today we have Jeff Otten, who's going to go over some, some of the ODP technical skills. And Jeff is currently the club director and head coach at Triumph Aquatics, right? Not Triumph Water Pole, but Triumph like, like Aquatics. Yep. And um, he's also the head cadet boys coach for the Southwest Zone ODP program. Um, and again, I just want to remind everybody that yeah. all of these sessions are, are uh, yeah, can be found um, online at the TXWaterPole.com website. Uh, thank you so much to James Smith for providing that. And this is our first uh, kind of our first Tuesday and we're going to do Tuesdays and Thursdays for this week, next week and the week. And our last uh, kind of kind of Tuesday, Thursday is going to be June 2nd and June 4th. So then after that, we're going to do a slightly different format with some different days and some different times, but I will announce that in a little bit, but we do have six more of these Texas coaches to coaches on Tuesdays and Thursdays in the, in the coming weeks. So now I'm going to, I'm going to hand it over to uh, uh, Jeff, and the floor is yours, Jeff. Wonderful. Thanks, Joe. And again, okay. as as uh, Jeff gets started, please, if you have any comments, this is an open sharing session, please, please feel free to either ask in the chat feature or kind of unmute yourself and ask. Um, just, yeah, just ask verbally. We want to share kind of ideas back and forth, so please, all input is welcome. So, okay, uh, Joe, is it still showing up? We're good yes. to go. Yes, awesome. wonderful. Okay, so uh, first off, just going through today, um, outline a little bit of a system of play, um, which is really the the end goal here, and seeing where technical skills fit in and, and why they're important and how they help in the overall um, success of a system of play. And then going over practice planning and whether you're dealing with um, experienced athletes or even new athletes and just how you're implementing a skill or even maintaining skills um, through the course of a season or, or over a, a period of time with different groups. And then just looking at technical skills progression and looking at how you can combine skills and, and how it builds upon and what core skills are necessary. And then just go over some next steps and what, what's the overall goal of technical skills and, and what does it allow the athletes to do at the end of the day? So look at the system of play. Uh, again, I've uh, been with ODP for like four years now, and so this is pretty much uh, their, their operation here. Um, but you can see that with all the different facets of the game and technical skills are showing up under each one of them. Um, the ODP motto, it's, you know, they want to build a solid foundation. It's the idea that it's technical or tactical, that we're building up these athletes so that they have a strong base of skills across the board. And then all they have to do is go out and perform at a given time. Um, and with the way the ODP system works is we build the pipeline. Um, it's not just like getting to heavy duty tactical skills um, early on in the process. It's just making sure that the national staff has a large group of athletes that understand the USA technical skills to select from. And then as they move to the pipeline, eventually, um, you know, they'll get to you know, say the cadet national head coach and he then has a game plan, but all these athletes have, of course, have technical skills that allow them to do their job at the end of the day. Um, we've, we've had a lot of uh, national coaches come to our camps over the years and, and they always end up leaving like, you know, in a certain day, like, yeah, we might have practiced a skill that wasn't how you do things back home at your club, but the overall goal here is always to add to your toolbox and we're constantly building. Um, and just so that you have additional tools within your arsenal um, so that when you're faced with different decisions, you, you have um, the answers that you need in that moment. So going over practice planning, like how we would go about implementing technical skills. Um, big thing here is just utilizing a warm up. Um, and especially once you have the technical skills built in and you're doing more of maintaining of technical skills, you can use that as warm up. Um, a lot of the defensive skills require a lot of legwork. So you can, it can be really cheap uh, legwork instead of just sitting stationary, which 
isn't really the ideal way that we use our legs. Um, we want, we're doing like leg work and things like that. We want to be doing drills that will mimic what we do in the game. We're, so for the most part, we're not really sitting static in the water. We're, our, all of our drills are very dynamic. Um, so we utilize that more during warm up. Um, I know Mark a couple weeks ago covered horizontal to vertical and just the ability to control and move over our hips. Um, this can be done with reverse sculling. I've got some videos coming up uh, with an athlete that we worked on um, that you can see how she's working through things with that. And then as well as ball handling skills. And again, you know, if, whether it's just walking with the ball, so learning balance with the ball, strengthening your legs, you can work faking in this, just doing laps and laps working with the ball or doing up slides, ball in hand. Um, you know, it's things like kids never really want to get in the water right away. Like they dread it, it's cold, but if you give them a ball, it, it makes the process a little bit easier for them. Um, so I found that that does help. And then overall just eventually combining skills, um, which really does a lot more of the horizontal to vertical, whether it's uh, transitioning over your hips, reverse sculling, um, change of direction, shot blocking, things of that nature. Um, and then at the end of the day, um, you know, going back to like the ODP philosophy, we really want to build up muscle memory so that when it does come time for say, you know, regionals in the state, the athletes aren't having to spend as much time sitting and thinking about what they're doing. They already have the skills necessary, but to accomplish that, you do have to spend a lot of time and be very consistent with building up technical skills. Um, things I've found that have been beneficial as far as training them Grid work is one of the, the easiest ways to do it. Um, so I say grid work, it's, um, you kind of just spread them out into different spots in the pool. Um, if you're in a pool that has the little like dash marks, those are great like space identifiers, like especially now with the whole uh, coronavirus, spacing's gonna be really important. So you could utilize that um, for grid work. And when we go through grid work, you can do this with shot blocking. You can do this with drive defense, um, even center work. Uh, center defense can be done with this. Uh, I like to do it on a whistle typically so that everything's controlled one step at a time, especially early on when you're working with either younger athletes or, or giving new skills to an athlete where they don't need everything at once. Like you really want to make sure each step is perfect. Um, so when, when you're in this grid, it's very obvious if someone's off, like if their timing is off, or if they're dropping their hips too soon, things of that nature. And once they've established a core foundation of, of skills, you can start doing laps of it. So this goes back, builds a little bit more into warm up. Um, you can do laps of reverse sculling, laps of shot blocking, things of that nature. Um, and eventually moving to partner drills. The, the challenges with partner drills um, can just be if there's a mismatch. In, in skill or even if, if you're doing driving and the offensive driver skills are much stronger and then they can't even really work on drive defense because it, it, it's almost just pointless. Um, the other, some of the downsides to, to partner drills um, can also be, well, the kids just get too far away from the wall and they start screwing around and it can be a little difficult to coach them when they're all just floating. So partner drills work a lot better once you have a core group that understand how you want things to work and then it's just going out there and, and doing a kind of a walkthrough and, and you trust those athletes to perform at a high level and they're not going to be screwing around as much. Um, some of the challenges I've come across with building in technical skills, especially with our younger athletes or even a new club is it's very difficult um, when you don't have an in water example. You know, water polo, it's a fairly difficult sport and, and the movements aren't the most natural and it's really difficult to teach something, a movement, when you don't have an example. And, and it could take a very, very long time to accomplish a simple skill just because the athletes don't have anyone to watch. Um, ways you can circumvent this is don't be afraid to get out of the water. Call, you know, yes, it does take time for them to get out of the water or swim to you but there's opportunities there to make sure that they're hustling to the wall. There's opportunities, you know, because other, the downside is you could spend half a practice yelling across the pool where they're not hearing you or they're just screwing around and it never really gets fixed. You might as well take five minutes, get them out of the water, actually run a demo on land where you can, you can make sure that they're 
in correct body positioning and they're moving the correct way before you put them back out in the water. Um, when teaching, I, I've said to start doing this more, um, more recently, I know it's a very uh, like grade school learning to write a paper style, but like the four W's and just why are you doing it? When are you doing it? Where are you doing it? What are you doing? And so when we go to implement skills, which we're going to kind of go through here in a second, it's ask coaches can ask themselves those questions and even ask them out loud to the players and, and get a verbal response from them to get them communicating and understanding what they should be doing, why they're doing it. Um, so that it's not, you want to get to the point where the kids like have ownership of what they're doing and actually care about and have passion so that as if, if they're out there just doing it because coach says like they're, when it comes crunch time, when it really matters, they're not going to do it. They're, they're not focused on it. They're not building up the muscle memory that's really going to be necessary when things are just happening. Um, and, and that's what we really want eventually, you know, each athlete to get to the point where they're not robots. You know, yes, they all have a course set skills, but they're out there just moving and reacting and, and they don't have to spend a lot of time processing information. Things just happen over time. So looking at the technical skills progression, there's such a, a core set of skills um, before you ever really get into water pole specific technical skills, uh, whether it be reverse sculling, head of freestyle, vertical breaststroke kick, egg beater, elbow swimming. Um, and we'll watch a video here in a second on some of those. Um, and when we look at like elbow swimming, the, the whole concept here is we're trying to, yes, it's just moving you from point A to point B. Um, but the benefits are it's teaching the athletes to have a play with a lighter upper body so that when they do get to an offensive player on the perimeter, they're not top heavy and they don't end up losing their hips and, and getting turned and putting themselves in bad defensive position. Um, and then when you're looking at once you have some of those core skills, it becomes a lot easier to teach technical skills. So they've already been doing elbow swimming, laps of that, and that was part of their warm up. and they didn't really think much of it, and all of a sudden you can start adding lunges to it. Um, elbow swimming, again, it's teaching them to play with the lighter upper body so that when you start teaching a, a double arm lunge, which is um, the, the USA men's side is really pushing at this moment where you're diving ball side, uh, and you, you want to make sure that you're not, again, not too top heavy so that you can quickly uh, counter spin and react to whatever move the offensive player is making and that you actually have lighter arms and your arms aren't just flopping around in the water, making contact with a player's head or, and whatnot. Um, and this shot blocking, of course, just making sure you have proper um, egg barrier base positioning. Um, and then when we start getting to the overall application and we'll, we'll do a couple more slides on that where it's like, you know, now that you have this core skill and, and we've, Learns of technical skills. How are you using it? When are you using this technical skill? Why are you using it? Um, let's see if this pops up. Did it come up? Okay. Is it up, Joe? Okay. A little graining. Uh, so, anyways, just sculling over legs. Uh, when we go reverse sculling, we always want to make sure we quickly move between point A to point B. Um, the goal here with reverse sculling is you're able to keep your eye on the ball. You're not having to turn your back to the defense. You can quickly step back and cover two meters. Uh, when we get to zone defense, and Sabrina is going to do a lot on that in the next uh, week or so, it's important that you have those skills. Um, so it's reverse sculling, and then we'll go to egg beater. So here we're just working on balance. So she's in a hips up position here. Um, uh, we are not seeing the videos, Jeff. Okay. So what you might have to do is just stop sharing and then reshare the video specifically. Sorry, I was on mute, I apologize. Gotcha. It's all good. I've had all sorts of, yeah. of the technical issues along the way here. 
if there's one if there's one good thing is I am getting much better at this whole I'm becoming much better and much more tech savvy so okay are we good now yes okay so I have tough egg beater here um, I have it short and I have to replay it a few times so just focus on balance in the water the, the benefit here is how much space she's taking up as you can see it's wide position her hips are up at the top of the water uh, in this situation, her core would be tight. She could quickly step back on her legs. She could move in almost any direction she's wanting to when she's in this situation. Um, we're just focusing on, again, controlling space. And then the reverse sculling video, we'll go back to that. Um, benefit here, quickly moving between point A and point B, as, as I was highlighting. Uh, we'll, again, you'll use that more in, in zone defense or any, really anytime you're moving to a ball. It allows you to never turn your back on a player, right? Um, it's even like, you see it even at the younger levels, if there's a loose ball, a lot of our players will want to just turn their back to the offense and swim to the ball. Well, great job, you got to the ball really quickly, but now you have no idea where your defender is. You're not looking at the cage. That defender most likely followed you and now their hand is on your back and you're at seven meters. You know, what offensive options do you have there? But if you reverse skull to a ball, you can, you're can you able to one, you can get to the ball quickly, you can engage the ball, and then if that defender does come towards you, you can get on your legs, try on base, you can mark up the defender and maintain space. So um, I'm a big believer in, uh, in teaching the reverse going. How, how would you teach this to a, a brand new athlete that just came out, like a uh, first, uh, first season 12-year-old? Uh, so uh, a lot of this I uh, learned from Spencer. Uh, uh, Jordan, but they, they they use the term bicycle kicking a lot. Um, and that's the the general mo leg motion. Um, it ends up being a lot of trial and error. I, I remember years ago at Pearland, I had a kid doing this, and he was going the opposite direction. And the harder he worked, the more he went the other direction. Um, but the, the core concepts are keeping your feet up towards the top of the water, making sure you're on one of your hips, making sure your feet are pointed forward. You're still using your hands as you're pulling yourself through the water. Um, a great test for that, you know, again, because you do want your feet up towards the top of the water, a great test for this is just stopping uh, the athletes every now and then and just asking to see one of their feet, preferably the foot that should be at the top, right? So, so in this situation, uh, we can stop. Let's so like, Sophia, show me your left foot. And you're looking at how quick that left foot comes out of the water. And if that left foot's not coming out of the water quick enough, well, now you, that's the coaching moment. You're like, okay, well, let's keep going. This You need to make sure your feet are up towards the top of the water. So you're moving a little bit faster. Um, what we don't want are their legs dangling more towards the bottom of the pool. They're not as streamlined. They don't move as efficiently through the water. And a lot of times it, it just takes time. They may not get the first day, but they'll yes. get a little bit better the second day. They'll get it by this like, like the second, third week type stuff. So Yeah, that's, yeah, it, yeah. The kids, they always hate to hear that, but sometimes that's just the bottom line. It's the um, same thing with egg beater. So there you uh -huh, go. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, and then we'll go to lunges, if I can find it. No, title is elbow swimming. So she's got uh, a European athlete, still trying to get some things figured out here. Uh, she's got a little bit of a mixture of elbow swimming slash lunging. Um, but you, the whole focus here, and if you ever do watch the ODP videos with John Abdu, it's about the ability to cover ground. You know, breast stroke kicking, hips are staying at the top of the water. We can see that she is light with her upper body. You know, what we really wouldn't want would be for those arms to be crashing down really heavy in the water. Um, and this would be something where you're I'm a little bit closer to a core skill with the elbows swimming. And as you're going through this during warm up, if you see an athlete that's quite too top heavy, that it's they're exploding up really big out of the water and then crashing back down, um, they're unbalanced in the water. And whenever you go to teach proper base positioning or say the Superman double arm lunge, that's going to cause issues. So if you're doing a practice where you're wanting to teach the super arm double arm lunge, elbow swimming is a great precursor to that. You know, no, it's not really um, a big part of it, but it's teaching them to be light with their upper body. And as long as they're light with their upper body, when you go to teach the super arm, Superman double arm lunge, it just goes a lot quicker. And this is a good example of, you know, a lot of kids yeah. kind of transition from swimming to get a water pole. That is a, that, yeah, just, that is a good example of 
a non swim stroke that you are going to be using in water pole constantly. So correct. Yeah. And the, and so that was like a, she kind of had a combo between elbow swimming and uh, lunging uh, with the, the other benefits to the elbow swimming, you know, as you're working out towards a perimeter player is um, the, the term that ODP uses a lot is palm facing. You want to make sure that as you're swimming out, you're able to see your palms. The two benefits here is um, it takes away your temptation to grab because Joe, like you just said, kids, they, they, well, they, they learn to swim, you know, their fingertips are going in the water and we run into this problem that they, they work so hard to get to the perimeter. And then the next thing they do is just grab on and either commit an unnecessary foul or they grab on and drop their hips and then they get turned or they get out there so frantically and then they make head contact and the official excludes them. Well, if we do elbow swimming, we can get to where we need to be, but we've taken away that temptation to grab because our hands are palm facing. Um, and if you are working out to the perimeter and that offensive player, I don't know, is simulating or whatever, at least you can show the official, like, my, my fingers don't go that way. Like, I, I don't know what's happening with him, but here are my hands. And they don't, they're not grabbing him. Um, so it's all about different ways to, to help um, put yourself in a, a better situation. Um, so another core technical skill uh, would be shot blocking. And this could be done in laps, it can be done in grid work. Um, the general buildup for this would, and, and, and it sounds, sounds counterintuitive, just having them walk forward, do laps walking forward, even with their hands in the water, just so they're learning balance and they're putting weight in their hips, and they're sitting up off their hands. Um, the We really want a good tripod base here. So obviously her hand and the two legs, so she has pop, good tripod base. I would even say this hand's a little wide. Um, it could be, a little bit more centered in front of her body with how wide it is. If, if she sculls quick enough or tries to kick up a little harder, it might pull herself to the side or that hand might dig a little deeper in the water. And then if her hand's digging in the water, she'll start collapsing forward, lowering her shot block hand. Um, when we look at shot blocking, the, the key is here. Um, we want to make sure, again, tripod base or balanced in the water. We want to be bigger than the shooter. We want our hand flexed so that when the ball does make contact with our hand, it doesn't keep going. Um, and so we are, we're always stressing that with the athletes that if you just flex your fingers, it'll tighten the muscles in your wrist um, and, and your hand won't move around as much. And shot blocking right here is just the core position. There's so many different things you can start to add off of this, um, depending on the situation. Um, but without this base concept, it gets a lot more difficult. Um, the different things you could add to it, obviously knocking down, right? So you're working out to the perimeter, you're lunging and knocking down with this offhand. Uh, and then the important thing there is that when you do kick up and go to knock down, you're not losing your shot block arm. Because at higher levels like that, that's that window that the shooter's waiting for. So it might be a lapse of just kicking up, lunging, knocking down. Um, variations of this would be athletes actually swimming forward with this offhand and breaststroke kicking just to quickly close out to the perimeter and then lunging and knocking down. And then the next phase off of that is they could flip to their hip to recover back to two meters. Or you could have them start in a reverse skull position and close out to a shooter and then step onto the legs and go in the shot block form. Um, but you can see it. This was done um, for a video, but you, you can see how you just focused on balance. She's not falling. She still leans forward a little bit too much, uh, but it's not too bad. But that's generally what we're wanting in that situation. Go. This. Okay, so back on the... Yes. Okay, cool. So that's just the general, uh, again, make sure you have your core skills built up and then some different technical skills you can work off of that and then the application. Um, when we look at the, the press base position, uh, what you're really wanting here is hips are up, 
and, and we have a little acronym here at the top, and it really just makes sure that the athletes are aware of this at all times. So they know where the ball is. They know the players around them, the area around them, the center in the shot clock with the center dictating the majority of um, how you're going to play defense against Sabrina. We'll get into a lot more of that next week. But when we look at our, the skills that we'd be using with press based position or hips up, you could use some spider walk position if you're quickly having to shift left to right. I uh, want to make sure your left hand, left shoulder to quickly put yourself in the passing lane. Um, within intelligent pressure, what you're doing here is you're reading two meters and determining whether or not a foul is necessary. Right? If you're holding front, you can maintain press the whole time. If for you're losing front at two meters, well, then you need to, your feet should be towards two meters. You can foul the ball. You can step back to two meters and then transition over your hips and then get your feet pointed back to the perimeter because eventually you'll have to step back to the perimeter. You know, that's one of the key things with our athletes is one, be able to move over their hips and always having their feet pointed where they need to go. It, you know, you start with these younger athletes and they just don't, they're very cumbersome, but they don't move well in the water. And really that next phase uh, of growth for them is just moving quicker in the water, having their feet pointed in the right direction. I mean, even if they're still struggling to make the right decision or they don't have the overall strength uh, to perform it at the high, high enough level, at least their body positioning is correctly. Because with that younger athlete, you assume over time, like, yes, they're going to get smarter. Yes, they're going to get stronger. And as long as they've got the proper technique early on, you're fine. You don't really need to worry about it. Um, so we want to be in the press based position as often as possible um, to help us with our next situation. So when we look at drive defense, so we've got our lunging to lane. We're making sure that our feet are to the ball. Eventually, once that driver does start to attack, you're reverse sculling. You're giving water quicker. Um, and then this is something where like, athletes just kind of have to learn over time. And it, it's the drivers, like they're not robotic. Some are, but at some point they're not robotic and you might not be able to lock up or engage a driver as much as some other people like you might you get you swing out to the perimeter and they immediately attack the cage right away like okay well like I happened to me once I happened to me twice maybe this third time I don't go on to the you know I get to the perimeter but I'm already in a reverse skull position I can already step back on my legs and cover um, again with the el some of the elbows swimming here learning once they pivot over their hips just learning lighter hands um because we, we do run in that situation a lot where there might be some simulation in the water where the offensive driver might you know, just going under for whatever reason and again similar to like the double arm lunge you're you're showing the referee your hands and you're moving your hands one it keeps your hands busy so they don't get lazy and fall on top of a defender but also it it catches the referee's attention because they sometimes like it's a long day and all of a sudden they see water splashing and they get panicked like oh my god this driver's in trouble i need to bail him out and so the defensive player just you know stay calm make sure you've turned away from the driver you can move your hands let the referee know like hey i don't know what's happening to him but here are my hands he's fine um, we always want to make sure that we're maintaining ball side so going back to back in earlier always aware of the ball um, and then when we're finishing the drive we're either J hooking back in the lane, depending on how this how this driver has reacted. You know, sometimes you can just quickly give water and then step over your legs and breaststroke glide, and then the drive's over. Sometimes you might have to swim a little bit longer, depending on depending on how far out the perimeter was. Sometimes that swimming might happen immediately. You might not have time to reverse skull. And, and as you're going through practice and you're you're doing drills with this, and we'll look at this in the next video, it's really great to do on their own on the whistle. So before you add an offensive player with this, just breaking it down. Um, and, and the drill will show you, it's everything's done on a whistle. And if, it was, if there are more athletes, it, it works just as well, because again, it's very obvious. And on whistle one, you're lunging left hand, left shoulder, or right hand, right shoulder. And then whistle two, you're giving water. And then we'll, whistle three, you're stepping over your legs and your brush are gliding. And then you can speed that up and go to Lunch the lane, give water, turn and swim. And eventually after turning and swimming, they might have to J hook and turn to the outside and get themselves back into the passing lane. Um, don't have a video of the J hooking. I can find one uh, at some point and share it. But the, the concept there is that when you do turn back to the perimeter, if a driver stops, you're not turning directly into them. Because if you 
if they go to stop and you turn right back into them, you're exposing yourself to for them to lock up and continue attacking, uh, and then your hips are down, you're in poor defensive position. Um, another alternative is that if they're driving and you do give water, they'll read this as they should and just stop swimming and step into space and look to shoot, look to catch the ball. Um, at which point the driver needs to reverse skull, step over their legs, get into a proper shot block position, and then either one arm swimming while holding shot block, lunging, knocking down, um, or not. So we'll watch the video of Sophia. Okay, I'll lower the volume. Uh, anyways, this is done on a whistle. Uh, this was the first time she had done this, and I we could talk about it. I, I honestly, it's, it doesn't look that great. She's going to have to spend a lot of time working on it, and we'll kind of break down some of the technical skills that she struggled with on this. Um, we'll just let it play for the first time. So whistle one, she lunged to lane. She's in the lane. She's giving water, and we're turning, and we're swimming. Um, It'd be a lot better if for actual base positioning if her feet were up to the ball. Okay, you know, yes, you're really high in the lane there, but when you do that, you're dictating what they'll do. Um, and, and that the benefit there is there's less unknowns. You know, yeah, I'm giving up a drive, but I trust my skills in this situation. I trust that if I'm at X2, X1, my, my partner might step back and help me if necessary. And once you have that situation, like there, again, there, there's less unknowns, and that's what really what you're trying to uh, eliminate as much as possible. You don't want our defenders just out there working really hard, but not really knowing why they're working that hard and what's going to happen next. It, this game gets a lot easier when you can dictate or, or predict how the offensive player is going to react. Um, it helps you feel a lot more in control and it allows you to move to the next step. Uh, watch Sophia again. But so when she lunged the lane here, it really would have been great had she thrown her hips higher into the lane. And then this offhand, uh, her left hand here, really should be up in the passing lane, looking to knock down the ball. Um, and that is something we'll have to continue to work on with her. And then even when she starts to skull here, she's on, she has to flip her, she's off on the wrong hip. At, at initially, she kind of is flat in the water when she goes to skull. She should have been laying a little bit more on her right hip. With, and I know it sounds a little crazy, yeah, you're turning your back to a defender, but it's put, it's protecting you. It's preventing you from getting kicked out, and you can just turn and swim. Um, and the benefit here, and we'll go back a second. Like at this point, she gives water if a driver starts uh, starts his or her drive. But if that player stops driving, all all Sophia has to do is lunge back in the lane, and she's right there. Um, and, and that's the benefit of it. Um, and this is supposed to stop them from like grabbing and holding on the drive, correct? Correct. Yeah. And then the big thing, like, and we see this a lot with the well, a lot of a lot of the Texas athletes is say the hand. So right here, she's going left hand, left shoulder. It'd be where she would have her left elbow bent, and she's not fully extending. So she's allowing herself to sit a foot, almost two foot closer to this driver than necessary, um, which she's exposing herself that the. the if, the driver's aware they could quickly utilize that and spin to her back, gain inside water, and continue attacking. Um, but so that, that's the, the general theme there. Okay. Um, and then going through zone defense, um, how everything kind of works together. Uh, first part is just identifying two meters. Uh, and Daniel talked a lot about that uh, in the previous week, and, and Sabrina's going to talk about when she kind of looks at defensive tactical skills. Uh, two meters dictates pretty much everything um, we're doing on defense. You know, that's that has the, one of the highest scoring chances if the ball gets into two meters. So we really need to make sure that we're denying two meters as often as possible. Uh, and working to do that. Um, so just, again, on body positioning, we always want to be head and feet out. So even if we're starting pressed on the perimeter, it's 
hey, you know, yeah, you're in the passing lane, but there might be an opportunity where you have to step back into two meters. You need to have your feet angled towards two meters. All you have to really do is separate from, a, from an offensive player, skull under your legs, and then pressure glide over your hips. Um, ODP has been really big about this in the last couple of years in the player's ability to transition uh, between press and zone or zone and press. One, identifying when to do it, um, which honestly takes the longest. Um, and then the next part is just actively being able to do it. And the thing we find athletes are actually pretty, uh, they're decent at moving from press to zone, but once they get back to two meters, now they're sitting with their hips down and they're unable to go to the next step. Whether And that might be, they don't know what the next step is going to be. So they don't know how to position the body or uh, they might just be incapable of positioning their body and need more coaching. Um, zone defense, uh, also very similar to five on six defense uh, where you are covering multiple players, you're covering an area, you're not really responsible for a player, you're responsible for an area. It's very important that you have proper body positioning in this situation as well that you can always step and cover. Um, I think the, the biggest example is X1 and X5. So when the ball is moving uh, down to the wing, and they're not always looking to shoot. They're usually looking just to shift there. But our X1 and X5, they have to remember that their responsibility is that corner. They need to be positioning their legs and stepping to cover the near side low corner and taking away that as a shooting opportunity. Sometimes we see – X1, X5, where their feet are positioned to the shooter. And as that ball moves to the one or the five, uh, one or six, they step directly at the shooter. And, and if they just would look behind them, they realize they've left a giant gaping hole to the cage. Um, and, and they haven't really done their job. So it's convincing players, again, even the, especially the younger level, that, yeah, I know this player has the ball, and I know you're really worried about that, but you need to worry about the goal. Like the goal is your focus, step and cover the goal. And then off of this, um, it's important that when they go to recover, they're using a breaststroke glide. So they've stepped on their legs, and then they just need to breaststroke glide back to the post. Because when you breaststroke glide back to the post, what it does is it throws your hips and feet back up to the top of the water so that if the ball goes back to the one or six, all you have to do is step on your legs. And, and you've already put yourself back in position again. Uh, years ago, I, I had an athlete that like, he did it perfect once, uh, twice, and then the, the third time when he recovered, he ended up with this, he was sitting vertical in the water. And then when the ball went down to the one, like he had no ability to step and cover air, cover the, cover the space and allowed a goal. And it's like, it's kind of happy with him, but at the same time, it's like, hey man, you, you had it. And all of a sudden you didn't, so what'd you do wrong? Um, and we'll watch the zone base recovery. Or yeah, Jeff, we all yeah, we all have stories about that where the kid does it <laughs> once right and then they never do it. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, yeah, just after that. Or they do part one and then they forget about part two, three, four, and five. Uh huh. Or or they just want to kind of kind of do part one and skip to part five. Yeah, without doing the two, three, four. Eggs. Yeah. Well, and then that's why it's, it's like muscle memory is such a big part of it. Um, you just have to drill it over and over and over again. Um, so in this situation. Before we run the video, imagine she's already dropped. She's already covered two meters, but a play, you know, the player she's responsible for on the perimeter. So she, it's great. Sherry has her feet. She's head and feet out. She's ready to move on to the next step. So she's sculling out. She gets a little bit closer to the player. And then she's able to step onto her legs and get into proper shot block, shot block form. And then once she's minimized that threat or the ball's moved or whatnot, she now needs to step back cover and this is really important if you are running uh like a, a two or three man zone where communication is really important and that we're getting all the way back uh, sometimes you again if the players aren't getting aren't recovering properly they're not able to do the next step uh, here and then she'll flip to she'll lunge to knock down and then she's flipping to her hip and there's a couple of different variations of course you could do here um she could be using her left hand that goes back to water. She could be using that to breaststroke kick and pull herself back, or she could just breaststroke kick. Or here in this situation, she was just egg beatering back. Um, it's also really important uh, if 
the offensive player still feels super confident that they can get the ball into two meters here, or if they're trying to get the ball into the post on six on five, that the defensive player is patient. Um, again, like Joe said, there's always a story where, like this kid sees a ball in the air and feels really confident they have the best legs ever. They're going to jump up and grab this ball. And then they miss it by a, a, a fingernail, like just barely. And they have to understand that, you know, they're in proper position at this point. They're in between the ball and the player. They don't have to do anything else. All they have to do is maintain that space. Eventually, that ball is going to fall. And as long as they're still in between the ball and the offensive player, they're going to get that possession, whether they take it on their own or, you know, the center or post player climbs up the top of them and they're, they're awarded possession. Um, and so this would be a drill where you could just have them sculling out on, on this one or on the whistle. They're sculling. They're lunging, knocking down. And then they're sculling back, and then they're counting how many brushstroke kicks they're doing here. And I'm making sure that their feet are back up, because in, in this situation, we could replay this video, or, or she, I, it, the other video I had actually, she does it again, right? So she's already in the proper position that she needs to be to go back out to the perimeter once she flips to her head. Um, so all she'd have to do in that situation is start sculling, and she's ready to go. And this is just repetition, 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 correct? Over, over and over again. Um, I, I really enjoy it. Um, I, I know it can get a little bit much, um, but you know, it, again, you might have a tough weekend of games and like, I've got to fix this. I have to sit and just work this over and over again. And the last one, um, just a little bit on the offensive side here. Um, the, the first thing is just, tripod base positioning um, where they're say if they're right-handed they're in that tripod base positioning so and this really starts at the end of the counter um, and, and so much our, our kids really struggle as a southwest zone transitioning through a counter our, when we when a lot of our athletes go through a counter they're so worried about just getting to a spot they're not again not really reading they're not paying attention they're just like i just have to get to the spot and then i sit and then the, the clock runs out and i swim to the other end and they're not really thinking about what's next in the process. You know, they should, the first thing they're doing is they're showing down the pool and they should get into a tripod based position so that they're, you know, they're 45 degrees. If they need to make themselves available to catch the ball, it's possible. They should be marking up. Um, so marking up, like all you're doing here is taking your offhand. And if there's a someone guarding you or someone in your space, you're just getting a hand on them just so you know where they're at. So that if there's an opportunity to attack space, you don't have to go find a defender. Like the defender's already there. You can make your move and keep going. Um, we ran into that a lot um, at ODP Nationals that the kids would, they were smart. Like our kids, like they saw the space, but their first move was either too slow or it was too slow because they didn't know where a defender was or they weren't in good tripod based position. They were sitting with their hips down and their arms dangling to the bottom of the pool. Like you're not ready to do your job in that situation. So it's really important that we're always positioning ourselves for the next step to go do our job. So when you do see that space opening up, you can just go. You don't have to go find your defender or get your body in position. Um, and that's really what you, as you go through the progression of building these athletes, like that's one of the big steps is when they start getting in proper position all the time. And really that should be done. We want, it'd be great if we could get that fixed at an earlier age. So even though they don't know how to do something, or when to do it, or they might not be strong enough to do it yet, but they already have that core fundamental so that whenever they do start to figure the game out or, I don't know, grow any muscle, like things just happen. Um, honoring space here. So for the most part, like water polo, it's, it's three things. It's spacing, moving, and timing. Um, and so the spacing here, it's, yeah, you finished your counter. I've marked up my defender. I've marked them up one, so they're focused on me. They're not trying to step back into two meters. Okay, because if we swim down the pool and we just sit with our hips down and we're just dangling our arms to the bottom of the pool, why, why would a defender waste energy on you? You're not, you're not doing anything. You're just sitting here. So that's when, you, that's when it turns out those defenders are floating away and now they've stepped back to two meters and you've, they've taken away that option from you really want to avoid that. Um, but locating the ball, knowing when it's an opportunity to attack into space, if you're sitting on offense and your teammate's driving, 
it's stepping into that space that they vacated. You know, you're, you know, and it's it teaching these athletes like you're doing this. It's, it's almost like a selfless act. Is yeah, you're stepping into space. You're most likely not getting the ball, but what you're doing is you're you're forcing your defender to make a decision. Are they going to come with you? Or are they going to step back and and help on that drive? And, and eventually, like if we build up strong enough technical skills and they're performing them at a high enough level, things are going to break down eventually on defense. It might not be the first decision they make, but by like the fourth, fifth decision, if we're executing our technical skills at a high enough level, you're going to find a mistake. And that's when you can capitalize on it. Um, but if, if we have, again, if we have weak, weak body positioning, we're not moving at the right time, we don't move uh, quick enough, we're not really forcing that defense to make decisions. Uh, again, I really think like the more times you, you make a defense, make a decision, eventually they're going to make the wrong one. It's just going to take some time. Um, and then moving with the ball and moving without the ball. And th this is something that was really evident in the different zones uh, at the ODB national championships it, or the kids that won are just comfortable with the ball in their hand. The ball touches their hand and it's up in double threat position. Uh, I'll show you the video of that in a second. ODP, they use the term double threat. The, it's ready to pass, ready to shoot. So every time you touch the ball, your shoulders should be dry. You should be uh, ready to pass, ready to do your job and identifying open, uh, open players and whatnot. And then off of that, it's learning to move without the ball. So use that example again, if one of your teammates attacks the cage and there's open space, well, you need to slide into it because ideally that defender should be stepping back to help. And so, yeah, they just took away the drive, but now you've slid into open space. You've given yourself a better shooting angle. If you get the ball, you're ready to do your job right away versus sitting stationary. Your defender never leaves you, or if they do leave you, you're still staying at seven meters out on the lane rope. Like you're, you're not a threat. Like the like college coach will always say, it's like, why waste energy on someone that's not a threat? Like you have to have proper body positioning and put yourself in a situation where you actually get honored and they want to guard you. We'll have to walk through this one a couple of times. It goes quickly. Anyway, so the ball's going to two meters. And, right, again, it's, it's, it's dictating how the defense plays. Like, you know the defense in this situation. They should be crashing back. So anticipating that they should be crashing back, looking to help two meters. Again, you, you've now dictated what they're doing. You know how they're going to react, so you feel more in control of the situation. Able to step into space. Uh, you could either, in this situation, she's not really swimming. She stays in a 45-degree angle. She's really just breaststroke kicking forward. Um, Someone like kind of what Mark went over a week or so ago. We really don't want athletes to go to a vertical, uh, you know, hips up swimming free, or sorry, horizontal. We don't want them swimming in this situation because that ball's coming back to them pretty quickly. You're only having to cover two, two meters, maybe three meters max of space. You can quickly like take a couple strokes, shuffle into that space while maintaining shooting position to receive the ball. Ball goes in. She's stepping into space, improving her shooting angle, and then shooting. Um, and this could be that she could take a bigger stroke. She could upslide into the spot. Is there anything else? No. I do have to say, I wish I had that set up in my backyard. <laughs> it's, uh, the, the goal has been coming in handy. It's Okay, and then really just the last thing here, um, understanding like, what's the end game. Um, and th these players, they, they always, they're always in, in transition. They're always moving on to something else. And uh, another, well, it's more of Brian Alexander saying, but somewhat of an ODP, they, it, the terminology is process over outcome. Like, you know, yes, it's, I don't know, like eighth grade tags and, and you're worried about winning, but it's like, well, what are these kids doing next? Next up, next they're going, to high school and you know four years later they go off to college and it's a situation where you, 
it's been, we want to prepare these athletes so that they have all the technical skills necessary to succeed at the, at the next level. You know, instead of worrying so much about game plan and X's and O's, just focus on increasing their technical skills and, and trusting that if across the board all of your players have really high technical skills, it's going to play out to be good water polo. And, and it will make drawing up plays a lot easier. And so that when you know an athlete goes from eighth grade, ninth grade, and – their coach calls a timeout. It's like, okay, we're running this. They don't have to raise their hand and ask how. Like they just they they know they're comfortable with the skill and they go out and perform at the next level. Um, so the thing is, as long as we continue to focus on that, at some point, like technical or tactical, like things will play out. Um, as long as you're work continuing to worry about the process over the outcome. That's all, Jeff. I do appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much. For those that are on here, um, hold on a sec. I just I just put in I just put into a chat the ODP technical skills. So what that is basically, I'll just share it real quick and just kind of share everybody real quick. What it basically is is it's impossible to do all this in one session. And uh, and Jeff just hit kind of like some highlights. What this is is. Is, a, is over 50 different drills that are broken down into 20, 30 second clips of all the different ODP skills, offense, defense, um, a lot of stuff that uh, Jeff just kind of went over. So if you want to have that link, then you can go kind of find those online and kind of go down that rabbit hole yourself. So it's also the mobile coaching app that they're. Yeah, yeah, there's also push. the, yeah, there's a mobile coaching app that USA Water Polo used to have. There's also the new coaching app that USA Water Polo does have now. And those have access to a ton of just easy at, like, at, at your fingertips, yeah, like type stuff. And a lot of stuff can also be found on YouTube as well. So just wanted to show you guys that. But that is, but that is that, uh, that is that uh, link that I just put in the, uh, in the chat. Um, does anybody have any questions for Jeff? Jeff, I do. I kind of. I cannot. Uh, I cannot tell you kind of how much I appreciate you coming on and kind of doing the technical skills and such. Um, again, you know, for everybody, yeah, that is on. <coughs> this will be um, like the video will be posted at TX Water Polo at the Coaches to Coaches section. And um, uh, was it this upcoming Thursday? We have Sabrina Carlisle kind of doing front court defense. Uh, next week on Tuesday. We have, um, you know, Mihai Opre doing shooting, uh, and we have Jeff Chandler doing um, six on five on Thursday of next week. And then we have, um, I'm going to be doing a kind, of, kind of practice planning on, on Tuesday, June 2nd. And then Caitlin Kelly is going to be doing coaching women's water polo on Thursday, June 4th. And then we're going to kind of, again, we're going to do a little bit different type of setup in June. I'm going to get those details out to everybody as we can over, like, over the next week or so. And then obviously we also have our Southwest Zone Town Hall meetings every Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. And tonight's is going to be uh, kind of Texas athletes playing water polo in college. So please kind of kind of tune in and I kind of do appreciate the time. Jeff, again, uh, thank, yeah, just thank you so much. Yep, thank you for the opportunity. And I'll stay on if anybody has any questions for a couple minutes. But I'm going to